All right, welcome in. Can you believe it? It is week four of the college football season, and we have got you covered here on the college football edition of Bet On It. Joe Ranieri alongside Kelly Stewart and the one and only Marco D'Angelo breaking down a couple of top 25 great matchups this week. We didn't have as many last week, but we have got some great ones going at it here this week, and we're going to start with Friday night, Kelly, as uh, again, I, did anybody see uh, Illinois or Nebraska being at this point in the season ranked number 22 versus number 24? Is this the Matt Rule era? Is it officially started here, Kel? That's a really good question. I mean, this is Nebraska's best start in almost a decade. The last time they were right there in 3-0 and in Nebraska, right, 2016, now you've got Dylan Riola, the uh, Patrick Mahomes wannabe, and uh, he's throwing, you know, five touchdowns so far, and everybody's ready to say the Corn Huskers are back. I've even had an, a couple of Nebraska trolls reminding me that K State didn't have a national championship. And then I said, well, the last time you guys won one, I was like 10 years old. So congratulations to them for being back. But uh, Brett Bielema and uh, company from Illinois may have something to say about that here on Friday night. I think they have the better defense here plus the points as Marco kind of found out uh last week over Central Michigan. We'll see if uh Nebraska who covered their home opener or excuse me, it covered yeah, their home opener against UTEP, and then obviously beat up on Colorado. Look, they're both good against the spread, but 9 points was way too high. This one's down to seven and a half. Uh I got to listen in on VR segment for the gold and it sounds like early money came in on Nebraska to do a little what we like to call setup for Illinois I may be on Nebraska come uh Thursday night we'll see seven and a half is not nine and I wish I would not have paused to think about the children of the corn for too long but I did so I'm looking at this one we'll keep an eye on it if uh line I can get back up here I may have to be on them on Thursday on Friday night Oh, and uh, in that VR segment, Gold, that has not happened yet, uh, did he happen to give the next six Powerball numbers? I'm just curious. If he did, send them our way here. Marco, just uh, curious here, my man, as we've got, we've got another top 25 matchup, and uh, I might be a little biased on this one, so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, how much you love Oklahoma State as they are at home taking on Utah, the uh, the brand new darlings to the Big 12. One and a half, Marco, we're starting to see 51 and a half. Cam Rising is back. Are you buying Utah or are you buying Okie State? Imagine this, a Utah game where we had to check the injury report for Cam Rising. <laughs> Can you believe it? <laughs> I just it's a shock really yeah uh yes cam rising will be back he missed last week's game with the finger injury uh but i'm looking at this utah team and joe i am gonna throw some shade on your oklahoma state oh. team uh Bastard. do you miss your old defensive coordinator mm. i just you know I, I i gotta ask you that you know i mean he, he's at ohio state and went on to greener pastures but Speaking of pastures, there's been some wide open pastures in that secondary for uh, Oklahoma State. Did the Razorbacks, did Pig Suey run for, uh, put up 600 and some yards against this defense just a couple weeks ago? And that was with three turnovers. Let's, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm picking on you, but let's be honest. Uh, this Utah team moving to the pa the Big 12 from the Pac-12, um, the reason they had success the last few years in the Pac-12, I believe the Pac-12, I like to refer to, was a finesse conference. It wasn't a physical conference. Uh, they liked to score. They didn't like to play defense. Well, Utah was big on both sides of the football. They dominated the line of scrimmage uh, both sides, and they would play you physical. They would wear you down. I think you're moving into a conference that's exactly the same. How many teams play defense in this conference and want to play that smash mouth type of football? I think Utah is going to come in here and dominate this game. They will be able to move the football. They've got a balanced attack. You look at this team, they're averaging 194 yards on the ground, 229 through the air. 
Uh, just miss being a 200 club member. You know, I love to point those out college football teams, but those numbers were obtained with Cam Rising missing a game and a half. He went out in the first half uh, of the game, he missed the second half, and then missed all of last week's game. So their numbers are going to be even better offensively. I just don't think Oklahoma State will be able to stop this team, and I think it's going to be a long afternoon come the fourth quarter when you're trying to stop that running game for the 35th to 40th time. Good luck with that. Give me Utah 31-23. I'm taking Utah to get the job done this week. Not going to lie, Mark, I'm a little disappointed in that whole breakdown, but that's fine. That is fine. Not a problem. That's why they'll go that's ahead and play. That's what you're disappointed play. in, Joe. I'm disappointed in the fact that the man still does not know how to use Do Not Disturb on his cell phone because that's all I can hear his entire breakdown. So in the comments section, feel free to yell at him for acting like Adam Trigger. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, Mark. I didn't mean to call you during that segment to tell you to screw up. I'm only kidding. Uh, all right, so we do have one other top 25 uh, game here we're going to talk about. It'll be uh, late, I believe. Uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon is what we're looking at when Tennessee – uh, and their coach, Josh Heupel, head to a place in which I believe he won a national championship as a quarterback back in 2000, Oklahoma, Norman, Oklahoma, Tennessee, now laying seven and a half, 57 and a half here. And listen, one of these teams has a prolific offense. One of them does not. I don't think we have to figure out who is who here. We know Tennessee can score and score with the best of them. They have a freshman quarterback that everyone is floating around the word Heisman with, and they have uh, pretty much offensively done whatever they want against every team that they have faced thus far. In the meantime, the offense for Oklahoma with Jackson Arnold is not very good. They have struggled immensely. The one thing that has kept OU in games thus far, of course, is the defense. You would expect that from OU. The only concern you're going to have with Tennessee in this game is that it is their first true road game of the season. The North Carolina State game uh, was only about an hour and a half, two hours from them. It was a neutral site uh, in North Carolina when they took on NC State. This is going to be a real test for the Vols. Uh, they are also defensively going to have to play. We have seen Josh Heupel teams in the past not do well, including last year when they went against top-ranked teams on the road. They lost by 14, and they lost by 29 to Alabama and Missouri. So if you're skeptical about Tennessee at all, you're skeptical about this defense going on the road in Norman, Oklahoma, and will they be able to hold up? They've done a pretty good job thus far, but can they hold up? Because we know Tennessee likes to get out quickly. And I'll share the number with you here, guys, because I've talked about it last year. I know some of you in the comments had asked me a couple of weeks ago about what was that Josh Heifel number again in the first half? There has been nobody, and I mean nobody. He is the single most profitable ATS coach out of 305 in the first half over the last decade. This includes him, a head coach at Tennessee, as well as UCF. 43-17-2 against the number in the first half. That is what Josh Heupel coach teams are. By the way, at home, when they're on the road, 22-7-1 against the number in the first half. They covered 24 and a half against Chattanooga in the first uh, game. They covered the four and a half in the first half against NC State. They covered the 33 and a half last week against Kent State. Will they do it again this week? Well, if you're going to look at this game to bet it, that might be uh, the way to look at it here. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Tennessee looking to get it done early and often in Norman against OU. All right, well, week uh, four here of the college football season. It's time to talk a little gold here with our good friend Yanni the Greek. And uh, early action this week. Some uh, notable moves we're seeing in the marketplace in this week for Yanni. What are you seeing? Indeed. And already, Joe, a couple positions that got dummied up. And here's what I'm talking about. Friday night, start off with a primetime game. 
Illinois. Soon as the number came out, small little limit bet got him up to plus 10. That's when the money started coming in on the Illinois side. After a little Nebraska money got it up to where double digits, that's when the Illinois steam came in 3x, 5x, 7x on the Illinois side. Same thing with the total. Dummied up the 45, then the real move on the under. So a little confusion if you look at that line movement, but rest assured, Illinois and under the positions, they were looking to lock in at better numbers than the opener, and that's exactly what happened. Same uh, Friday night primetime, San Jose State plus the 12 and a half. Move over to Saturday, Houston plus six, Houston plus five and a half, all the way down to Houston plus four and a half. But resistance on Cincinnati minus three. Now drop down to Iowa, Minnesota under 37, Ohio plus 20. This is one of those where you don't see resistance and it means something uh, to pay attention to because it happened with Rutgers. They got hit at key seven of seven, went to six within one minute. Within five minutes, it was down the four and a half. What happens? They hit the four and a half as well, dropped it down even lower. Usually you'll see a little bit of a take back, especially when that key number of seven gets hit, but that has not happened even after the adjustment through that four and a half. Pay attention when something like that goes on. BYU plus the seven, stopped at the key number of seven there. Go on to Baylor, Colorado State. I mean, Colorado, excuse me. Huge under move. Don't know if it's weather related yet because they went under 55 and a half and 54. That made sense because I thought there was recency bias. But then today, get me some more at 52 and a half and we'll even take 52. That's huge because I talked about in the very first week, lines that move three plus points, even though they got steamed, if you got the opener, you hit about 60 plus percent of your bets. If you got the close, you're at 50-50 and actually lost money because of the VIG. And yet here they are betting the under three points after the initial move. That's a telling sign there. Go to Purdue plus the six, plus five and a half. TCU, SMU. TCU at minus two from one group. SMU at plus three from another group. Shows you how tight some of these lines are. Shows you how important these numbers are, especially around those key threes and sevens. Go down to Utah, plus two and a half, plus one and a half. I mean, uh, all the way to minus one, to minus one and a half. It's sitting at two and a half now. The key is, what happens? Does it go to three? And if it does, do we see the Oklahoma State money come in? And how much of it? How much of it? That's going to be key. What kind of move comes in if that happens? UL Lafayette plus the three and a half. That's why it's at that uh, key number. Michigan USC, same thing, two-way action. At six and a half, they like the USC side. If they could get a touchdown, they'll pay the VIG. But at four and a half, it's all Michigan. So once again, in these marquee games, high profile, pretty tight lines. LSU minus 24. And finally, Navy plus the 10 and a half and plus the 10 on the Navy. And last game on the board, Western Kentucky which went from pick them up to minus two, two and a half. And that's when you saw when it hit three resistance on Toledo. That's why we're looking at two and a half right now. So you're seeing that even though one side's getting hit, when it reaches a key number, another group, and sometimes that very same group will come in and buy some back. Because the goal is just to try to grind out profit, make ad take advantageous positions. It's not about predicting outcomes which, you know, is pretty hard to do. So whether you follow or fade, again, I just hope you cash them, don't trash them, and you're able to confirm and do some damage. All right, nothing like a little gold here to get week four of the college football season rolling. Do want to re uh, remind you guys, great time joining us on Saturday for Last Call. VR shows up, gives you all that last-minute steam and everything you need to know. Kelly Stewart, VR, our friends from the Westgate, uh, make plans to join us each and every Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern time, live here on Wager Talk TV. And don't miss any of those uh, those big line moves before kickoff. All right, it's time to head to a trap spot here. And nobody does traps quite like Marco D'Angelo. And Marco, there might have been one or two on the card this week, but you have chosen one that has got trap written all over it, my man. Yeah, Joe, this is one of those ones where I'm going to give a shout out to uh, our dear friend that we lost a couple months ago, uh, Dave Koken. I did many radio shows with him over the years, 
And he introduced me to a phrase, you can lose the same game twice. And that is the mantra for this play. And I'm talking about the West Virginia Mountaineers. What a gut punch of a game last week against Pitt. They went into that game. They went to the fourth quarter in Pittsburgh in a rivalry game. And let me tell you, the backyard brawl to West Virginia in Pitt is as big as Ohio State, Michigan is to the rest of the country as far as rivalry goes. And that was the best game on the weekend card last week. Those two teams went up and down the field. And like I said, Pitt rallied from 10 points down in the fourth quarter to win in the final minute of the game, get the victory. I don't see how West Virginia picks themselves up off the mat, heading back home in this one to play Kansas. And right now, I think we're getting Kansas at a just a wrong number, to be honest with you. This is a team that had higher expectations. Um, They've lost the two games in the last uh, two weeks that they probably should not have lost. And I think everybody's giving up on them and we're getting them as an underdog, which if this game was played a couple weeks ago, they would have clearly been a road favorite in this game. And who did they lose to? They went on the road and played an Illinois team. That's a game that both Kelly and I were on Illinois. Illinois got the job done, but I'll be honest with you, we were kind of lucky in that game. We had the benefit of uh, a couple key turnovers uh, that saved us uh, in that game. And the UNLV game, you know, UNLV on paper, they were returning home, uh, was Kansas. They should have got the job done. But UNLV is playing very good football. They did it last year, first year coach Barry Odom, and they are lighting it up right now. So maybe we're going to find out that UNLV is a lot better than people thought. I'm looking at Kansas here. They're going to score points. I look at the West Virginia defense, and they played Penn State the first week. Everybody was on West Virginia as a home underdog in that one. Uh, It was supposed to be a rebuild for Penn State. Well, no problems. Uh, Penn State drilled them 34 to 12, put up 34 points. They did handle business against Albany. Well, they're supposed to. Uh, They beat them 49 to 14. I want to point out that Albany threw for 306 yards in that game. Uh, Last week, Pitt threw for 301 yards against them. I think Kansas is going to have a field day, uh, both running and passing the football against them. I'm going with them to lose the same game twice. I'm taking Kansas. I think the wrong team is favored in this one. Give me Kansas plus the points and definitely a sprinkle city here uh, with Kansas. I'll tell you, it's a small dog. Give me shit about it. Yeah, but we're going to take them. (laughs) I I can only do what the line is, Kelly. Yep. yep. Rest in peace to the goat there, uh, Dave Cogan. First and foremost, that's why Marco doesn't have the barking dog segment anymore. And second of all, (laughs) Marco doesn't realize that that big drop off is not that big. I'm looking at Ralph and I's spreadsheet from July, and we had West Virginia as a one-point favorite. Oh, I don't know. Unless they fire their offensive coordinator in the next uh, 48 hours, I'm not buying it. <laughs> Literally, we had this problem last year, Marco, with these little dogs there. Uh, but, you know, by the way, your, uh, your Pitt Panthers uh, were part of our uh, Fade Joe Public uh, play last week, and they got the win outright for us here. We've got another one coming up this week, I think, another uh, dog. But let's talk about big dogs, Cal. And I mean big, big dogs here. Uh, where is the DDD double-digit dog coming from this week uh, in college football? Look, I'm not sure they're barking. That would be pretty asinine to say. But – They might be barking. Uh, I'm looking at this team last week. Yeah, what did we see from Miami? Oh, that's right. They beat up on Ball State and Florida A&M. And, oh, maybe, just maybe, the Florida Gators aren't any good. Everybody's talking about this team and how their power rated so high and how they need to be in the college football playoff conversation. I'm not buying it just yet. You've got a USF defense giving up less than 150 yards on the ground. Oh, well, Cam Ward's not going to throw the ball. Okay, fine. This is not a spot that is conducive for Miami. It's not far away. We're talking a three and a half, four hour car ride from Miami, bus trip. Maybe they're going to take a team plane with all that NIL money 
But USF, this is a dogfight that they're going to be in here. And while a lot of people want to believe that Miami, the U, is back, I am not one of those people. This USF team not only took Bama to uh, a scary place for a very short period of time. Obviously, Bama won that game. But USF had real, this team for two years in a row, really on the ropes. I've seen them have Florida on the ropes as a big double-digit dog. Again, I'm not saying they're going to win the game outright. 16 and a half, though, too many points. Too many points there. 16 and a half, even a 17 or so out there. I mean, when you say it can't, it's Mario Cristobal, we all know it is very possible for an outright dog winner there by South Florida. Uh, all right, so we've got our fade Joe Public uh, play this week, and I am going to take a look at one Greg Schiano going on the road with Rutgers, uh, taking on uh, taking on Vatek at Blacksburg. Not an easy place to play, but I do think Rutgers is a great opportunity right now to be able to jump on. Number one, we know Schiano historically coming off a buy, an extra week to prepare, which is what Rutgers has done. He has been one of the most profitable coaches to back. Say what you want about the guy, love him or hate him, at 17-8-1 and one against the number with an extra week to prepare for teams. Uh, defensively, he makes life very, very difficult for teams. In the meantime, I think Virginia Tech was overrated to begin with heading into the season. I think Vanderbilt... Uh, showed exactly why I thought they were a little bit overrated here. They've got wins over Old Dominion and Marshall, which aren't very good teams. Uh, the defense, once again, not bad there for Vatek, but not one of the better ones that we've seen. The thing about Rutgers this year is the fact that they shut down deep passing this year. They're sixth in defensive uh, pass plays here. They don't allow passes over 10 yards, which means they're not getting burned in the air. We're also watching an offense for Rutgers that is just one of six teams that does not have a fumble so far this season. They haven't turned the ball over. This is exactly the kind of team I would expect Greg Schiano to have. They are going to run the ball well. They're not going to shoot themselves in the foot and they're going to lock you down defensively. In the meantime, Virginia Tech has a habit of turning the ball over at the inopportune times. And I love that quarterback for Vatek. I think the kid's going to be really good, but he throws way too many balls that can be intercepted and picked off. And I think Rutgers is going to go ahead and make them pay on a couple of them here. I get more than a field goal, tough place to play, but coming out of a bye, I think Rutgers is exactly the team that uh, that we should be playing this week. Fade Joe Public. They all love Virginia Tech. Not me. I'm on Rutgers plus the three and a half. All right. So we go from fading Joe Public to a little T and A. <laughs> Hell of a segue there. The Penn Ralph Michaels in the house, ready to go here this week. College football. Uh, week four here, Ralph, so no doubt there's got to be a game here that's got one of those TNAs just staring you right in the face here. Which one is it? It is. I'm excited about the new segment, giving out a TNA play of the day in both college and pro here on Bet On It. And when you look at Kentucky, I can tell you this. I did not ask Marco this question, but I'm sure I did. At the beginning of the year, if you looked at Kentucky's schedule, you might have said, playing South Carolina at home, Georgia at home, and having Old Miss on deck with hosting Ohio in the middle is probably one of the worst sandwich spots you can have. But here's the adjustment we have to make as football handicappers and football fans. Had Kentucky beaten South Carolina and beaten Georgia, there is no way in hell I would be on this game because it would be a huge sandwich spot. But when you had the expectations of Kentucky, you completely shit the bed against South Carolina, putting up 183 yards in a 25-point loss. What do you do? You rebound. You play a great game against Georgia. You end up having a 22-yard edge, but you lose the game by 1.13 to 12. Now this Wildcat team has to completely refocus to make sure last week's game does not cost them two games. 
When you look at a team like Kentucky and teams that are big favorites with a very low total, I went to the database since 2015. Favorites of 14 or more with a total of 43 or less have covered 63% against the time. And if that team is a favorite of 18 or more, those teams have covered 71% of the time. Another system that fits the Kentucky Wildcats. Early in the season, the first four games of the season, if you are off a home loss by one, two, or three points, you have bounced back. Those teams have gone 99 and 56 against the spread. That is 64%. If you exclude teams as a double-digit dog coming off a close home loss, you have gone 69%. And to finish it off, if a team like Kentucky is off a close home loss, excluding double-digit dogs, and they are now a home favorite, they have gone 78 0.6% against the spread. Yes, Ohio's been a very solid team the last couple years, but I'll tell you what, they had some quarterback named Rourke, who I guess is doing pretty good for the Indiana Hoosiers. That's a big loss for this team. Their quarterback now, Navarro Young, and hasn't been tested at all. This defense likely holds Ohio to seven points or less, and I clearly feel they can get to 28 or more to cover this spread. All right, Ralph Michaels, there you go. A little TNA for the day. By the way, Ralph, those that are uh, itching for a chart or two, uh, where will they be able to find them during the week for you? Don't worry, guys. I will still be posting the charts. Follow me at Twitter, at CalSportsLV, and my Instagram. And again, uh, you're not going to be without the TNA. You're just going to have to go to Twitter to find it each and every week. Ah, oh, does I love a good chart in the middle of the week. All right, from TNA to best bets, let's get it going. All right, week four of the college football season. A lot of different places to look on this card. Uh, we liked it a little bit better than we liked uh, last week's here, Kelly. But focus us. To tell us, what is the best bet uh, and the game that you circled for us? Last week was tough. I had mm. uh, our best bet, South Carolina, won. And it should have went out right. But boy, after it didn't, everything just went to hell in a handbasket. Uh, Joe, I'm going to tell you something I told myself a few years ago. Whenever Jonathan Smith is an underdog, I'm going to bet him. I bet him two weeks ago at Maryland. If you guys remember, he was at Oregon State. Now he's at Michigan State. Uh, they got it done for us at Maryland, even though two touchdowns get called back. And we're looking at this kind of a flat spot maybe for Bill O'Brien's team. Coming off that terrible loss there in Columbia, Missouri, where they had the Mizzou Tigers, an SEC team, if you will, on the ropes. And who did Michigan State have to play last week? I don't even remember. Uh, some team that's a basketball school. I think they're called Prairie View. So essentially, they paid a team to have an early bye week. You got a Michigan State team that, shockingly, is got one of the best defenses I've seen in a long time. And I know that sounds crazy, but now do they almost have an offense? I, I had to like sit back and watch that Maryland game and go, is Maryland's defense this bad or does Michigan State actually have an offense? 27.7 points per game, 249 passing yards, and almost 170 yards rushing on the ground. When that defense is though, only giving up 11.3 points per game this season. I like the Spartans team and as I said, Rules are rules, Joe. I'm getting six and a half here with the Spartans at Boston College in a kind of a letdown spot, if you will. Marco touched on losing a game twice. I don't know if it's the exact same scenario, but look for Boston College to possibly get upset by the Spartans on Saturday. Yeah, I, I am with you. Jonathan Smith as a dog has been extremely profitable over his career, and he'll have another opportunity to prove why here this weekend and marco you have been uh continue to uh cash those tickets uh on the football field whether it be the nfl or college football and i believe you've got yourself a pretty good opportunity uh this week as well for clients yeah joe uh the nfl's been real good college here on the show full disclosure we've sucked so far after uh winning 11 college best bets in a row last year on the show uh, we've got some work to do.
But if you want to come on board with our premium selections, we've got a deal for you this week. Get seven days, all access for $77. Use coupon code MD77. Guys, we are going to have a 5% play this week. We had one last week. That's only my 11th 5% play since February. We're 9-2 and two with those plays. If you buy that one game by itself, it's $35. Here you can get seven days of all of my plays for $77. Use coupon code MD77, and we do have a 5% play going this week. Last week's 5% play was the Cincinnati Bengals. Tune in this weekend for that. But let's get on the winning track here in college football. I carried Kelly in the NFL last week. Kelly carried me this week in the college because my play sucked last week. But I'm going to get into the win column this week. We are going with Iowa. We're going to lay the two and a half points on the road with them. And I know the knee-jerk reaction here is to grab the home underdog against the team that has had a history of having trouble scoring. I get all of that. But you know what? Iowa showed they could score some points this year in two of their games. Granted, it was against Illinois State and Troy. The one good team that they faced, well, it was the same old story, right? Uh, they lose 20-19. to 19. But two things I'll point out about that game that they lost 20-19. to 19. It was against Iowa State, rivalry game. Those games have had a history of being low-scoring games. And let's be honest. Iowa State has a pretty good defense uh, as well. So I'm not going to push the panic button on this offense yet. I'm going to look at Minnesota, and yeah, you could say Minnesota's defense has played well. Um, they've had two shutouts in a row. Yeah, Shutting out Rhode Island and a very bad Nevada team, I'm not going to write home anything about those two wins. What I am going to look at here is, is although Minnesota scored, uh, you know, big numbers uh, in those two games, the one game where they played a team that is comparable, they played North Carolina on the opening night, and that was a game they lost 19 to 17. They only scored 17 points against North Carolina. I don't remember anybody ever confusing North Carolina having a good defense in college football. Uh, so the fact that they struggled in that game is a concern. And I'm going to go back to last year's game between these two in the history between these two teams. Going into last year, Iowa had won eight straight in the series against Minnesota. They lost last year. And in that game, it was a typical Iowa game from last year. It was a snooze fest, 12 to 10. They only lost by two points, but they were minus three in the turnovers. We know doesn't matter if it's college football, NFL football. If you are minus three in the turnovers, you're going to lose the football game almost every time. In fact, that even minus three in the turnover department, they only lost by two points, tells me how much better they are than this Minnesota team, or they were last year. And I think they are again this year. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to lay the points. Now, you might point out if you look at the schedule, but they got Ohio State up next. They do in two weeks. They got a bye week next week. So no look ahead to Ohio State. But guess what? Minnesota's got a trip to the big house next week to play Michigan. I'm going to go ahead and lay the small number here. I think it's an overreaction to Iowa not scoring in the one quality opponent they faced this year. They're going to get it done in Minnesota this week. I've got them winning 23 to 13. Take Iowa is my best bet. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Iowa also on a hell of a uh, string of overs, by the way. I never thought that we'd talk about Iowa as an over team, Marco. But guess what? It's a new era in Iowa for sure with Kurt Ferentz and company. Lay the two and a half, says Marco. And make sure you visit him at his page at wagertalk.com. Take advantage of that opportunity to partner up with him right now. All right, best bet for me here uh, this week. Unfortunately, uh, I made the mistake of backing Florida State last week for a best bet, and boy, did that suck. Won't make that mistake again. Instead, I am going to go with a team that I watched. Uh, I watched both of these teams, in fact, last week a lot, and one team I could not have been more impressed with than the other team 
Yeah, is Tulsa, uh, who got boat raced by my Oklahoma State Cowboys. Uh, They made Bowman look uh, like he was uh, Joe Montana, Tom Brady, all rolled into one with a little Peyton Manning hair. Uh, It was ugly. The secondary and the defense of Tulsa is not good, certainly against the pass. They're taking on Louisiana Tech, who I watched play against North Carolina State. And let me just tell you something. Outside of the University of Colorado, Nobody, and I mean nobody, throws the ball more than Louisiana Tech. Their coach, Sonny Cumby, uh, one of the uh, the smarter offensive minds in the country here, they rotated through a couple of quarterbacks, and these guys were throwing all over what is, to me, a very good defense in North Carolina State at home, and they had a ton of success in that game there. Unbelievable, averaging close to nine yards a pass play right now. And don't forget, Tulsa's big claim to fame was a win against Northwestern State. If you're going, what is Northwestern State? Well, let me explain to you. You might have heard last week when South Alabama beat them 87 to 10. That's not a good win by Tulsa. What we got last week from Oklahoma State in Tulsa is much more indicative of the kind of season this team is going to have. La Tech at home, they opened up as a dog, two and a half, three points as a dog. They're now a three-point favorite here. So the market seems to agree that what I got from Louisiana Tech the last couple of weeks, much more impressive than what I got from Tulsa. I'll lay to three. I'll even go money line. Do not sleep on Louisiana Tech against Tulsa this week. And there you got it. You got best bets. We got double-digit dogs. We got a trap. We're fading Joe Public. And if you hit that like button right now, give us a thumbs up. Uh, You will, without a doubt, just stay right there. And you will get to watch the NFL version of Bet On It with Teddy and VR and Ralph and Andy. That's on your screen right now. But on behalf of Marco and Kelly, we appreciate the time as always. Best of luck with the plays. We'll see you again next week with another edition of Bet On It.